10, verses 24 through 25. It's where we are going to be this morning. Um, my name is Seth. I am so excited to have the opportunity to come and share the word with you guys. Uh, as you guys know, we have been going through this series um, through our vision as a church. Um, and last week with Jim, we were going through the gospel. And today, uh, because we want to be a church that is centered on the gospel, all of our theology, right, comes from God's word and the gospel. And then today we're going to be talking about community. We want us to be a church that is um, growing in our Christian community together. And then next week we're going to be talking about mission, how we need to be living on mission for the gospel together. Um, and so today, uh, I want to spend a little bit of time and just remind us, while they're getting the PowerPoint up, um, of the gospel, okay? Uh, Jim talked about this a little bit last week, but the gospel changes everything. What you cannot come to understand the gospel and then stay the same. When you come to recognize who God is, that he is a holy God, completely separated from sinful humanity, and that because of our wicked deeds, we have separated ourselves from him, the creator of the universe, whom all things are made for his glory. When you recognize how transcendent he is, how awesome he is, and how the wicked things I have done have left me eternally condemned before him, it causes your soul to despair. But that's where the good news comes in. Because our Lord did not leave us in this state. And though he is just, though he is righteous, he condescended himself, leaving heaven. He came to earth as a man. Imagine that. Almighty God taking on a frail human form and being born in a barn. He lived the perfect life that you and I could never live. A life of sinless perfection. And then in a complete act of utter humility, he gave his life and died a torturous death on the cross, undergoing the wrath of God, bearing your sins on the cross. He didn't die for any wrong thing that he had done. He died for the wicked and evil things that you and I had done. So that as we look to him in eyes of saving faith, we would be forgiven we would receive his righteous life as he bears the punishment of our sins. You cannot come to understand that and live the same way. You cannot come to see our God and what he's done and be like, oh, that's nice, cool. You can't. Once you come to understand the gospel, once you see who God is and what he's done, it changes everything. And that includes our involvement in Christian community. For the believer, the question, because of the gospel, is now that I understand who the Lord is, how do I live? How do I live as a result? So let me pray for us, and then we're going to jump into this morning's passage. Lord, you're such a great God. Lord, I, I am so entirely inadequate, Father, to, Lord, to, to even paint a small picture of who you are the great things that you've done, the great things that you're doing, Lord, your kingdom that is still to come. But God, I ask that this morning you would give us clarity of mind to wake up, to see why we're here, to see what it is that you've called us to. And Lord, that we would be obedient to pursue your great and good will in our lives. God, you are such an awesome God. Be glorified in our fellowship this morning. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Today we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25. I want to encourage you to turn to your Bibles uh, there at this time. I always encourage you guys to follow along in the Word, to draw in your Bibles, to make notes, underline, circle stuff, anything that helps you remember. Um, and we're all going to stand for the reading of Scripture. Standing is a way that we remember that this is God's Word. This stuff is powerful, and we need to be obedient to it. I'll also have the words on screen. This is what it says, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. All right, this is the word of the Lord. You may all have a seat. All right, before we dive in and talk about the specifics of these next two verses, I want to give us a little bit of context. Now, the book of Hebrews was originally written as a letter. We call it an epistle. 
where God was and still is encouraging Christians today to hold fast to Christ because Jesus is greater than any angel. He is greater than any priest. And the covenant that he mediates is far greater than the old covenant that is passing away. And in fact, God takes the first ten and a half chapters of the book of Hebrews to show that Jesus is superior to angels, to the old covenant, to Moses, to everything. And then in chapter 10, verses 19 through 23, he shows how the gospel, how understanding these truths about Jesus actually changes the way that we live. Because again, when you recognize who Jesus is, Almighty God, and what he has done, your life becomes all about his glory. Seeing Jesus glorified in your life and in the lives around you becomes everything to you. And this is what, this is what verses 24 through 25 are calling us to do. And so the main point I want to drive home as we go through the message this morning is this. We need to consider how to stir each other up to love and good works for the glory of God. And we're going to see this specifically in four different ways. Number one, by actually considering it. Number two, by meeting together. Number three, by encouraging each other. And number four, by recognizing that the day is drawing near. So let's talk about the first point. Actually considering it. Okay, Considering how to stir one another up to love and good works begins with actually considering it. Surprise, surprise. I think this is the most obvious and I think the most easily overlooked point in the entire text. But from the very start, we are called to consider, that is to fix our minds upon the believers around us. Okay, take a look at the people around you. These are the people you need to be thinking about, all right? If you are anything like me, you are a pro at thinking about yourself. You're a professional at thinking about what are my needs? What are my desires? What do I want to excel in? What does Seth Remmer want to do? And yet here from the very start, we are called to consider others. Because Christ is my life, I can't just think about myself anymore. Your life isn't about you. It is about the glory of God. And having God at the center of your life means it changes the way I view life. Now I start to think, how can I better help others love him and live for him? Living for Christ through the work of the Spirit will supernaturally cause me to focus on others. To consider, how can I stir up my brothers and sisters to better love others and to live for the Lord? In fact, Christian fellowship is the natural byproduct of gospel-centered living. So when you find that a church is struggling with community, it more likely stems from a poor spiritual apprehension of the gospel than a poor understanding of Christian fellowship. And I know at this point, it's easy for us to think of other churches and be like, man, you're right. They're not preaching the gospel, and that's why they're struggling with community. But how many of us this past week have thought, man, how can I encourage this brother or this sister in their walk with the Lord this week? How can I build them up in the Lord? Or how many of us are wondering, man, I wonder where this brother is at. Like, he seems to be struggling. Like, I need to meet up with him and help encourage him, help ground him in the word and in Christ better because I want to see him thriving. It's easy for us to point at others and to see where they are shortcoming, but how often do we examine our own souls to ask, is that me? Am I someone who is continually looking to the spiritual needs of those around me? Or are you and I just thinking about the people that are under our own roof? Because having the mind of Christ redirects my focus from myself to the community of believers around me to ask how can I stir them up in their walk with the Lord. And that all begins with actually considering them. And in considering them, we need to consider specifically how to stir them up, okay? As it says in this passage, we are to consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works. Now, this Greek word for stir up um, is, often, is often translated to incite or provoke or stimulate, okay? And so we're supposed to provoke each other in our walks with the Lord. Now, for a lot of you guys, you grew up in homes where there was an instigator in the home. And if you grew up in the Remert household in the 1990s, which that would be one of us, I was that instigator, okay? 
If there was a problem going on in the house, if there was a fight going on in the house, you trace the line back far enough and you will probably find me at the start of it, okay? I was uh, the oldest male in our family and so the strongest and I loved to poke and prod my siblings to the point of physical violence because I wanted to wrestle them to the ground and find pleasure in overpowering them. It was terrible. In fact, it got so bad at one point, I remember walking past my younger brother and he was standing at the top of the staircase looking for something down the stairs and I thought it'd be fun to just kick him down the stairs. So I did. <laughs> he hit his head on the railing on the way down. It I mean, it was terrible. And the, gra and the craziest thing of it all is my brother and I were actually really good friends and so I got to the bottom. I told him, please don't cry, please don't cry, I'll get in trouble. And so he did it. He choked back the tears so I wouldn't get in trouble for kicking him down the stairs. It's terrible, Okay. My instigating was not honoring to the Lord because I was provoking my siblings to violence. However, as a believer, you are called to provoke your brothers and sisters in Christ, but not to physical combat. We are to provoke each other to love and good works. You see, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. And this should characterize the life of the believer because the love of God fills up our hearts. This should overflow onto those around us. And so I want you to think, am I someone whose life is characterized by love, by kindness, by patience, um, by continually considering those around me? And as I'm filled up with God's love, am I pouring that in to the lives of those around me? Because the nice thing about love is that it's, it's contagious, right? When you're around someone who's really loving, who's full of the Holy Spirit, and they're caring about you and pouring into you, it actually fills you up to better pour into others. I met up with a brother just a couple weeks back who he, he was a very loving guy, full of the Holy Spirit. He encouraged me to a tremendous point that I found when I went home, like I was the best version of dad and husband that I've been in a long time, right? Because I was, I was full, because he'd poured into me, I was overflowing in my love and my compassion for my family. And as believers, this is what we are called to do, to consider how we can stir each other up to love and to good works. And the more you grow in your love for God, and the more you pour that into others as well, the more you desire to serve the Lord and to serve them, because you care about them, right? People, most of the time, don't have to pay parents to love their kids or to serve their kids, right? Because you care about them, you serve them. You prioritize their needs above your own. And it's meant to work that same way in, in, our, in our walks with each other. Because we love each other, we're looking to serve each other and to build each other up. The love of God guides your hands into good works, which according to Ephesians 2.10, were prepared in advance that we should walk in them. God has actually ordained these good works in our lives for us to engage in. And this is so good, amen? It, it, it's so good. Like, when we actually live a life where I'm thinking about other people, I'm not just focused on myself and how do I get the next AR-15 and what, like, when is Husker football going to finally be restored to glory days again? And I'm just focused up on myself and all my little hobbies, but instead... I'm starting to think about my brothers and sisters around me. How can I help encourage him in his walk with the Lord? Man, I see that he's struggling uh, with, with taking care of this around his house. How can I come and help remedy that problem, right? Like, as, as I begin to engage in this sort of mindset, it blesses my soul and it blesses the soul of those around me. This is so good. And this is the kind of community that God is calling us into. As believers, we need to consider how can we help stir each other up to love and to serve those around us. And what I love is that the text actually gives us three specific ways we can do this. By meeting together, by encouraging each other, and by recognizing that the day is drawing near. So let's jump into the second point here. By meeting together. We see this in verse 24 where it says, Let's consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. Okay? Stirring each other up to love and good works means that we can't neglect our meeting together. Have you ever been part of a group that neglected to meet together? One of the first things that comes to my mind is honestly high school reunions. Raise your hand if you've been to a high school reunion. Okay? Yes, all right? It's one of those things that you show up and it's like been 10 years. So you grab the venue, you all come together and it's like, oh, hey, it's 
Bo, it's Bo, it's been so long. How are you doing? Right? Everyone's hugging each other, patting each other on the back. We all have a fun time together. And then you get to the end, and everyone's like, oh, man, we should do this more often. And do you guys do it more often? No, not really. Some, maybe. Maybe some people are diligent about it. If you're like me, it's another 10 years before you see him again, okay? Right, because it's, it's not a priority to us, right? <laughs> we're, we're, as much as we love seeing our old high school class, right, I've got a million other things that take priority over seeing old friends that I barely see anymore, right? And because of that, we neglect our gathering together. It's just not a priority. And a prerequisite to stirring each other up to love and good works is actually meeting together. I know that comes as a tremendous surprise, but it's really difficult to spur each other on in our walks with the Lord if we're not actually engaged in community together. And so as believers, we must not neglect this. This must be a priority in our lives. If the gospel is true and our great king calls us to not neglect this, then we have to be diligent to pursue this. This has to rise to the top of our priorities. And we find this not only here in this passage. In 1 Thessalonians 5.11, we are called to encourage one another and to build one another up. In 1 Timothy 4.13, we are to be devoted to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to, and to teaching. In Ephesians 5.19, we're to address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. In Colossians 3.16, we are to teach and admonish one another in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. In 1 Corinthians 14, 26, we are to edify each other with our spiritual gifting. In Galatians 6, 2, we are to bear one another's burdens. In Ephesians 4, 3, we are to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And according to Philippians chapter 2, verse 2, we are to be of the same mind, having the same love, and being of one accord. And it is virtually impossible to keep these commands if we as believers are not regularly engaged in Christian community. Our meeting together is fundamental to the spiritual vitality of the church. It is fundamental to your spiritual vitality as a believer that you be engaged in Christian community. Trust me, I know this from personal experience. There was a time after college where I kind of isolated myself a little bit from the rest of the church because I thought, you know, like spiritual relationships get kind of messy. Sometimes you let people in a little too close and you got burned. I got burned my senior year of college. And so I thought, I'm just going to go to church on Sunday. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll be a part of the church community. And then the rest of the week, I'm going to do Jesus in me. Okay, I'm going to go deep in my walk with the Lord and it'll be good. But you know what happened as a result? I was not thriving. In fact, far from spiritually thriving, I was spiritually weakening. I was growing further in my walk with the Lord. I was growing weaker in my love for other people. I was suffering as a result of my isolating myself from the rest of the church. And in fact, I was being disobedient to Scripture because of all the passages that we just listened, that we just listed. And so as believers, we cannot neglect our meeting together. This should be a top priority for us. Don't believe what the world says that you can just go home and just do you and God and be good on your own. You can't. If you're being obedient to the Lord, we need to be engaged in this. You know, do you ever find it interesting that sports teams don't do all their practicing alone? In an age of booming digital media and access to all sorts of information and communication, you won't find a basketball team that ends up, when it's time for practice, ends up going to a whole bunch of different courts, right? Or going out to different basketball hoops and do all their drills, pop up their laptop, listen to their coach, right? And do it all on their own time and on their own schedule. What do they do? They all come together to practice together. Now, why does a basketball team do that? It's because, surprise, surprise, they're one team. They have to learn to play as a unit. They all rely upon each other, and, and they base their movements off of what each other is doing. And everyone is driven to work harder when you have a community around you who is all driven to pursue the same goal. You see, the world understands this, but do we understand this as believers? Because God's church works the same way. We are one body with one spirit, to be of one mind, pursuing one mission. And we do that better when we do that together. And in fact, I'd say it's almost impossible to do it in isolation. 
for the believer, living in Christian community must be a priority. It has to be. And that means that lesser things have to go. And so I want you to consider this morning, are you doing this? Are you prioritizing meeting with other believers to stir them up in their walk with the Lord? Not just showing up to church on Sunday morning so that you can be poured into, which is important. It's good. We all need this. But do you have a space where you go during the week where you're able to spiritually pour into other believers as well? And I'm going to say this. If you are not plugged into a small group where you can pour into other believers, you need to be. I printed off a whole bunch of extra copies of our GCG groups, okay, out in the foyer. They're, they're sitting on the front desk. I want to highly, highly encourage you, if you are not plugged into a gospel community group, to grab one of those sheets and to choose one to be a part of, okay? They will benefit from you being there and spiritually pouring into them, and you will benefit from being in that community and having them pour into you. We need this as believers. And if there are things that are keeping you from being involved, right, in, in, in a GCG or in community with other believers, whether that be sports, whether that be different hobbies, whatever that may be, that has to take a back seat. God does not command Seth Remmer to be the greatest paintball player on the planet. But he does call me to not neglect my meeting together with my brothers and sisters. This is something that we must prioritize for God's sake in his word and also for our own thriving. Apparently during their time, there were some that were in the habit of neglecting their gathering together. Brothers and sisters, we must not be like them. And so we need to not neglect our meeting together. Third point, we need to be encouraging one another. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. Stirring each other up to love and good works means that we need to be active in encouraging one another. Okay, the, word, the Greek word for encourage here is parakaleo. Everyone say parakaleo. Yow. It means to console, to strengthen, to comfort. Believers are commanded by God to encourage one another. Okay? This is a good command, amen? Like God's going to fashion this community, and of all the commands he could give us, right, it's, it's, it's not chase each other around in the parking lot and whip each other with pool noodles, right? As fun as that is in youth group, right? He calls us to encourage one another, to console one another, to comfort each other, to build each other up. These are good commands. Stirring each other up to love and good works will always involve encouraging one another. Just like the author of Hebrews is encouraging these Jewish Christians who are being persecuted in this time to hold fast to Christ and to recognize the greatness of this covenant that they're called into. Likewise, we as believers need to be involved in encouraging one another. Okay? I, on, at every season in my life, I've always had, by God's grace, people who have been encouraging me in my walk with the Lord. When I think back to my freshman year of college, I think of these two guys, okay? Uh, my buddy Nathan Caldwell and Dorn Schnooks. These guys were upperclassmen when I came in as a freshman. And when they met me on campus, they actually ended up inviting me to come and to be part of an upperclassman Bible study. It was almost all juniors and seniors. And so I got plugged into this group, and you want to talk about being encouraged. You want to talk about being sharpened. Seeing these guys who are three years older than me, who are so passionate about their walk with the Lord, and who were pouring into me, just made me burn with, with passion to live for God. In fact, I remember my freshman year shaving all the hair off my head to commemorate dedicating my, my life to the Lord, rededicating my life to the Lord. And I don't look good with a bald head, okay? It was literally like that kind of community was stirring me up to follow Jesus. And so who are those people in your life? Who are the people in your community that, man, they fuel you to live for the Lord? And, and how are you being that person to someone else? Is there someone in your life who can come and point to you and be like, that is someone who spurs me on in my walk with Christ? There's someone who, after I spend time with them, I want to follow the Lord more passionately. This is the kind of community that God is calling us to be. We need to be a people who actively think, how can I encourage my brothers and sisters around me to live more passionately for the Lord? Because this sort of community is beautiful. If you flip to 1 John chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, we read this. 
that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim, okay, the gospel, their, their, their time with Jesus, right, his words, we proclaim also to you, why? So that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, and we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Because of Christ, we have believed the gospel proclaimed to us, and now we have fellowship with Almighty God through His Spirit. That's powerful. And beyond that, because our God Himself is a community, He's a trinity, and His Spirit lives through His body, we are actually able to experience a certain degree of fellowship with God when we engage in Spirit-filled fellowship together. God works through his body, and that kind of community is so encouraging. Do you want to draw near to the Lord? Then be engaged in Christian community with other believers. You see, the commandments that God gives us are not burdensome. They are for our thriving. Imagine walking, to a bil- walking into a building where you were immediately, there are multiple people who know you, who love you, who are very deeply personally spiritually invested in your life and you know when you come to this place that people are going to encourage you that they're going to strengthen you that they want to hear how you're doing and you know that you're going to be pointed back to the lord and you're going to be strengthened to the core of your being man i think if we i think if we're really perfecting living in that kind of community that's the kind of community you don't ever want to leave right You don't have a problem coming together. You have a problem going home at the end of that. And that's the kind of community, man, that God desires for us to be and for us to be involved in. This is so good. And this is why I love my gospel community group. Those people in my group on Thursday nights, they spur me on in my walk with Christ. They love on me hardcore, and I look forward to Thursday nights. And I don't want that to be just for me and our little group on Thursday nights. We want that for all of you. Because that's when we thrive as a church. When we are loving and encouraging each other as we are regularly engaged in that kind of community together. You see, this isn't just free money, free's vision. This is God's vision. And it's worth fighting for. So I want you to ask yourself, who are the believers that God has brought into your life who you can actively encourage in their walk with the Lord? Who are believers that, you, that you'll run into, okay, at least once or twice a week, that you can encourage in their walk with Christ? I want you to look for opportunities to encourage them, to build them up in the Lord, because we all need this. You need other people to do this in your life, and they need you to do it in theirs. And so to the final point, recognizing that the day is drawing near. Stirring each other up to love and good works entails recognizing that the day is drawing near. And so I think it's important for us to ask here, what day are we talking about here? And we need to get a little bit of context for this. So I want you to flip to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 12 through 13. It says, But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. And I also want us to flip back a little further to chapter 9, verses 27 through 28. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Okay? This day that is drawing near that we need to be remembering is the day when Jesus' enemies are going to be made a footstool for his feet. He's going to have victory over them. It is the day when Christ is going to return a second time to save those who are eagerly awaiting for him. Biblically, this is often referred to as the day of the Lord. The day when Jesus returns for his people, destroys the wicked, and establishes his kingdom forever. This is going to be a good day. Amen? This is the kind of day that we need to live always, to to have always in our minds. Because when you recognize that the day of the Lord is coming, it causes you to live with a different kind of focus. I mean, I want you guys to think, if you knew, and no one knows, because no one knows the day nor the hour, right? Not not even the Son of God, right? Um, Only the Father. But if we somehow knew that Jesus was coming back in six months, 
how would that change the way you live today? How would recognizing that Jesus' return being six months off, how is that going to alter the way you live right now? Because I don't know about you guys, for me, I'm going to get really aggressive about killing my sin. I mean really aggressive. I'm going to get really aggressive about making sure everyone in my family, right, an extended family, I want to make sure they know the gospel, that they understand it, and I'm going to be pushing them to believe in the Lord while there is still time, right? I'm going to be going out and sharing the gospel, right, with the non-believers around me because I want them to know Christ because that clock is ticking, and in six months, he's coming, and I want them to be ready for that. You see, as believers, we are always called to live with the end in mind. We are called to do this all the more as you see the day drawing near. We are in that final age between Jesus' first coming and his second coming, right? This is it. And once he comes back, he's establishing his kingdom, all right? We need to be ready for this. We need to live with this in mind. Our God, our Lord Jesus, is not just another earthly king. He is not some temporary president. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the one who formed you in your mother's womb. He is the creator and sustainer of the entire universe. Everything exists for his glory. And when he returns, he will return to establish his kingdom forever. He is a great king. And if we clean up our house to get ready for the in-laws to come over, how much more should we prepare our lives for the return of that king? We need to be ready for this. Our God will judge the wicked with perfect justice and cast them into hell forever. He will have mercy on those who believe in him and those who turn from their life of sin to trust and to follow him. And moreover, he rewards us for what we do with the talents that he gives to us. So how do you want your master to find you when he returns? How do you want your master to find you when he returns? Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 24, going from verses 42 to the end of the chapter. He says, Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake, and he would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed, and he begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then also 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 4 through 6. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. God's word is not calling us to refrain from physical sleeping, but he's calling us to live with an alertness, to recognize Jesus is coming back and we need to be ready for his return. Are you living with this kind of mindset? Do you wake up in the morning thinking, okay, today might be the day that the Lord comes back. Am I ready for this? Because if you know Christ is about to come back, you're going to be all about encouraging your brothers and sisters in their walk with the Lord. The way we get ready for the return of our master is by being obedient to his will. And so as we see that day drawing all the near, and yes, it is nearer now than it ever has been, we need to be ready. So in conclusion... We need to consider how to stir each other up to love and to good works for the glory of God. We do this by actually considering it, actually considering each other, by meeting together, by encouraging each other, and by recognizing that the day is drawing near. 
Because if we are doing these things, community is going to happen. And we are going to experience thriving in our walks with Christ. And it will be a powerful testimony to our neighbors that Jesus Christ truly is the Son of God. Because they look at that kind of community and they're like, that's weird. That's different. And that's attractive. I want to be a part of that. Brothers and sisters, let's be diligent to be that kind of community. Let's pray together. Lord, you're a great God. Lord, you've given us your spirit. You've filled us with your love so that we can actually engage in this. In our flesh, this is impossible. But God, with your spirit, with you, all things are possible. And God, you actually desire this. You call us to this. So God, would you fill us with your spirit? Would you grant us obedient hearts? Lord God, would you guide our souls to prioritize, to pursue this kind of community and to encourage one another in the ways that your word calls us to encourage each other. God, you are a great giver and we know this is your will. And so, Lord, we're able to pray with all boldness. Lord, guide us into this. I pray that every person in this room, Lord, would be deeper, more deeply involved in this kind of community and encouraging others because of what your word has called us to this morning. Oh, Holy Spirit, lead us, guide us, and magnify your name in this place. You're a great God, and you're worthy of nothing less. And it's in your awesome name that we pray. Amen.